All right, let's start from the beginning here. If you ever hear me say anything like this, you know that I'm lying, or at minimum, I'm fooling myself. I've spent, I've only spent the last 20 years in software development. Uh, I had some distractions for the first 10 years of my, uh, my career. Uh, but when I started early on, uh, I, I thought I was pretty good. It, it's now about 20 years later doing it that I realized that I, I don't know much at all and that I've spent a lot of the past couple decades fooling myself and I'm just now learning how to stop that. But what I wanna talk about actually is how the, the most exciting thing for me, well, these days I work as a consultant. I help a lot of different companies adopt different ways of thinking and working, especially when it comes to different, especially when it comes to products. And I'm starting to see whole companies uh, that have stopped fooling themselves. Now, when I started in software development in, uh, well, in the, um, in the 90s, back when, late 90s was it? But back when Mosaic was a browser and, uh, and there was this new uh, Netscape thing. Uh, uh, I, well, when we did software projects, we would imagine a big idea, we would lay it out, we would plan it, we would design it, and we would build it, and we would launch it. And it would either be wildly successful or die big, and then we'd find someone to blame and everything would be okay again. Uh, but I'm starting to see companies that realize that that's a bad trend and they're doing things to break out of that. And one of the big cultural adaptations is that they're becoming more comfortable with, with failure. They, they've, they've learned how to fail. They've learned how to accept failure. Uh, well, that, that quote plays in my head a lot. Uh, if you're not failing, you're not learning. And if you haven't watched that, Derek Sivers' video, you should. If you've got kids, you should make your kids watch it uh, because it's good for kids. Uh, but uh, enough about these companies. I want to I want to talk about me for a bit. And I, I've got to reach all the way back uh, to when I first started. And I, I need to talk about my biggest, well, my biggest instances of fooling myself. Uh, I started as a software developer and I think I'm a pretty smart guy. And I was pretty good and, well, I started a company. I was given a first job. Our, our company built software for brick and mortar retailers and we'd taken on this weird special job to build a site to sell aircraft parts online. I still remember part numbers for aircraft parts. Uh, the, the light above your seat is a 315, in case anyone asks. <laughs> now, uh, this is Bill. Um, Bill is still at my company. Bill is a great guy, and I can remember looking Bill straight in the eye and saying, look, Bill, I've been working with these other developers. I can outcode them. They can't break my code. I can break theirs. Uh, Bill, I don't, you, you're not going to need to test my code. And uh, Bill smiled and nodded, and, and then Bill tested my code and broke it within minutes. And I learned that oh, these tester people do do things. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, one of the things I've seen over the the course of time is, or over the course of the last couple of decades, is testers move in and, and be really part of teams. Uh, I've seen the discipline of testing really advance now that we understand that testing isn't just checking things. That testers become really honest to goodness partners with developers. I love this particular picture. Just it was a recent, a recent workshop we were doing, and the lady, well, the, the lady at the top of the screen, she's a tester. The, the the guy at the front is a developer, and they've got this cool symbiotic relationship, where he's sort of talking out loud, telling her what she's working on, and she's kind of saying what she's testing, and she'll say, oh, this is, this is looking bad, and, and he hears it out of one ear while he's typing something else, and these guys are coding and testing at the, the, the speed of light. The, they're not waiting for any bug reports to be filed. Uh, they're working in a very different way. And, well, 
I'd fooled myself about what testing is and what testers do. And the, the lesson learned for me is that well, testing is a pretty critical discipline. Uh, it, it, like, there's a lot of other disciplines, and it takes years to get good at them. And if we're going to do anything significant, we need each other. And, well, that's, that's one area I started by fooling myself in with software development. And, and well, the, the other area I started with was <laughs> part of my distractions in my 20s is I had gone to art school. And uh, uh, back then it was called communications art, which kind of meant a hybrid of illustration and advertising design and things like that. And uh, I stayed there long enough to realize that this is a lot of hard work and I don't want to do this. Uh, and the software is pretty easy uh, by comparison. Uh, and so I, I went into software development and I eventually wandered back in. And well, if you're a software developer and you know anything at all about user interface, that makes you the UI person. And compared to other, well, compared to other software developers, I was white hot. I could make software that just really looked good. And, and, and working with my teams, well, they'd, I, I could go from just a, a rough idea of what something should be to, to something that looked like a good usable user interface. And everything was great. Uh, I was working with teams who we were on that long run of building things and things were coming out good. Uh, just out of curiosity, who here in the room has ever sat with a customer or user while they've used your product before? Ah, wow, this is so different. It didn't used to be this way at all. It, it, <laughs> uh, think back to the, the first time you did that. How did that go? It, it doesn't go very well a, a lot of the time. And uh, for me, when I shipped, I started to realize that, well, uh, user interface design is a lot more than, than looking pretty. Uh, this is a simple model that I draw on napkins all the time. So that is a napkin, and that is a, a time I've drawn it. And it, this is me dissecting just these really simple concerns. If I look at a piece of software, at the bottom I'm going to put this utility layer. If I find people that have a problem, a, a user that needs to be able to accomplish something, and I can give them a tool that allows them to do that, I'm going to call that the utility layer. Now, if I've given them something that really helps them, and I make it easy to learn, and easy to use, and, and efficient, then I can layer usability on top of that. And then, if I've given them something they need and they can learn how to use it and I can make it uh, sexy and consistent with my brand and, uh, well, there's more to aesthetics than just looks. There's that expression, you can't judge a book by its cover. And the reason that's an expression is because people judge books by their covers. And <laughs> software that looks bad on the outside, people kind of believe it's bad on the inside. So if it looks good on the outside, that inspires confidence and we can do better with, well, we can do better with software we're confident in. Now, if we can just get that raw utility thing right, we get some reasonably good products. Everybody's familiar with Craigslist and it's, it's not sexy. And if you dig in too deep, it's not horribly usable, but man, it's, it's it's super functional. It has stuff we need to do. Now, if you skip over that utility, and this is where, well, my first speed bumps, where I'd first fooled myself, is by looking at stuff that I could do uh, things in and that looked good. Uh, but I had, you know, maybe I had some elements of usability and aesthetics. And can you think of any, I had a hard time thinking of popular products that had usability and aesthetics, because usually they die on the market. Uh, but the only one I could think of what was that. So, does anyone here own a Segway? Just checking, OK. Um, this is a product that's been looking for a use for a long time. I'm not sure. Uh, no one's ever come up to me and said, you know, I want a device that allows me to get around at a modest speed, not too fast. <laughs> Uh, and, and doesn't carry anything. 
and looks really dopey. Can you, can you help me out there? And uh, it's a product that's still looking for uses. These, these, these guys don't look threatening at all. I, I, it, they make me want to shoplift. So, and then there's just the aesthetics thing. If you make software look good, and we all know what that's called. Uh, that's the <laughs> lipsticking the pig thing, and I was pretty good at that when I started. Uh, so it, well, it took a few times in front of people to realize that, crap, I'm building the wrong stuff. I'm, I'm not building things that solve people's problems. So the, the first trap we start to fall into is, look, what's wrong here is that we need better requirements. And if, if we had better requirements, all this stuff would, would go right. Now, I'm got, I've got to give this little thing, and if anybody's heard me talk before, I give this every time, because I just can't think without this little, simple little mental model. I need to start by telling people, and a lot of you have heard me say this before, that you are not here to build software, and, and, and you never have been. You're here to change the world. Now, that may sound daunting, but in fact, every time we ship anything, we make a, a little, at least a little ripple, and sometimes a really bad one. And the, here, the model starts like this. We look at the world as it is now, as it is today, and we find people that have problems or people that are confused or, or frustrated. And when we look at these people, well, we get ideas. Now, we might call those ideas products or features or enhancements. When we hand those off to people to build, we might start to call those specifications, and at some point in time, we might call them requirements. Now, I'm going, gonna, I've got to go off on a slight rant here for a minute. I, I started in a, in a product company, which is a lucky thing to do. I had lots of customers. My customers did not work for my company. I knew that if I went to any one of them and they told me what they wanted, uh, and I gave it to them, I would be dissatisfying some other customer, and I was responsible for the success of my product, and they weren't, so I made reasonable choices about what should go into that product. Now, my company had 30-something people when I started, but we grew up to a few hundred people, uh, and we started hiring a lot more traditional software people. And I remember uh, this weird tipping point where we had a lot of people and uh, a lady came up to me and said, hey, look, Jeff, the, the team that you're responsible for, we need you to add these things, well, we need to add these things that, into this part of the product that you're looking after. And I said, great, tell me a little bit about who's using the product, what kind of problems they have and how this will solve their problems. And she said, well, they're requirements. And I said, okay, I get it. Tell me a little bit about, um, uh, what are the customers that are going to be using it? And what are they going to be doing with it? And she looked at me like I was stupid and said, their requirements. And that's when I learned that that word means shut up. <laughs> and, and, so, and at some point in time in software development, we sort of forget that we're actually solving problems and we fall into the trap of we're just building stuff. Now, let me come reel back in from that tangent because well, we, we, it's important to remember that what we call requirements are our bright ideas that solve people's problems. Now, we move forward through this cycle, if you're using an agile process, if we're using anything, uh, we eventually deliver something, and that delivers into the world later. And what we hope is true is those people that were unhappy are now happier, and uh, not everybody's happy, and there are people you just can't please. N now, uh, well, everything between that idea and that delivery, I want to be, I want to give some clear language about this. That's all output. If you're practicing in an agile process, that's the junk we measure with velocity. Uh, that's the stuff we ship. That's the stuff we track with project plans. But it's not what we want. What we want is what comes after that. Uh, outcome is, well, what happens when things come out. That's why it's called that. And out, those people that are happy aren't happy because they saw the release notes or they saw the box, but software doesn't come in boxes anymore. But they're happy because whatever they were doing before, they can now do it different or better. 
The way we measure outcome is in terms of, well, people's behavior, how they behave differently as a consequence, and, uh, and maybe how they feel after they behave differently. And then one other word I'm going to splash in here is impact. Now, the, the truth is the model doesn't start with us solving problems for people. It actually starts with our company being concerned about revenue and asking us to look into particular people to solve problems for. And ultimately, our company wants some sort of return on investment. And it takes lots of people doing things differently and feeling happy about it before we get that longer term impact. So outcome refers to the, well, the things that we can see and measure. And well, Adrian was just describing, uh, when we deploy something, we start running tests. And what we're testing isn't how much money we made. Well, it could be if we've got an e-commerce site, but we're usually testing uh, how people behave differently. Those are the metrics that we gather, and those are the immediate outcomes. But if we're trying to uh, do things like uh, improve brand awareness or overtake a competitor of the market, those things take a little bit longer. I, I don't test those with my metrics, uh, at least not hours after I ship. Your job in, this, uh, in software development is not to build more stuff, it's to build less stuff. Your job is to minimize output, and at the same time, maximize that stuff. Now, I keep this model in my head because I pay attention to the people that are using this stuff and pay attention to what happens afterward. And hey, how many people in the room are using agile development before? Or, or before, now, <laughs> anytime. Uh, if you're using these user story things, there's this common template that gets used. And the, Template is the as I want to, so that, and well, th this template is about talking about who, what, and why. Uh, uh, what, who's the person that matters here? What, uh, what idea do I have for them, and how do we turn that frown upside down? How do we turn now into later? What I learned early on building software was that it does not matter what the requirements are. If I deliver exactly what people ask for and the outcome is bad, we lose. The corollary to that is you, if you deliver, if you don't deliver what they ask for and the outcome is good, you win. That's the trick here. Now, given that, you could say, look, then, all right, if it's not better requirements we need, we certainly need better research. We need to better understand what's going on. We need more data. Now, I've got to reach back and tell a story. I, I talked to him actually just last week, so I'm going to include uh, the story of this particular guy. This picture is not from last week. You can tell by the size of the monitor it's not. Uh, this picture was taken, uh, well, in 2001 when I, when, well, after a brief hiatus to work uh, in Silicon, well, excuse me, to work here in San Francisco to get my dot-com millions, and after that didn't pan out, uh, I went, went back to the company I had been at. And, and uh, this particular guy, Andrew, I'd hired there. He was fresh out of college. He is now a VP of product development of this particular company, and he's, he's doing well. Some of you might know me for that, this story mapping technique, and I should pull the picture down a little bit. That row of cards on the top is actually the first story map I ever built in 2001. But let me tell a story that I, well, the conversation I had with Andrew last week was about one of our customers. This is them. Uh, now, we build software for large brick and mortar retailers and other, other types of retailers. And this particular customer was really unhappy with us, uh, well, with my prior company now, unhappy with Andrew in this situation, because the return process on our software was kludgy and bumpy. And, and Andrew could look clearly at the data and see that returns were a fraction of the transactions that went through. Why were they making such a big deal about this? They were uh, less than 1% of all transactions. And uh, how bad could it be? But this particular company has some unusual return policies. This is a company that's extremely liberal with returns. They care a lot about how they handle people when they return things. And when you walk into their retail store, that's the, the counter where people do returns. Now, this is before store hours. And uh, we, I, Andrew didn't have a picture of what it looked like in, uh, during store hours, but he was there. He took this picture, and he was there during store hours. And there were lots and lots of people there. 
And what he saw was lots of people jammed up, lots of people behind counters trying to help them as quickly and politely as they could. And the software that he had written jamming things up and making life miserable for everybody. Now, the data showed that it was only a fraction of transactions, and the transaction time wasn't all that bad. But when Andrew was there, he saw that this looked really bad. This does not feel good. Uh, the returns all end up in bins, and they bag them, and they go to the back room, and, and there's a lot of those. Now, I pulled that picture just quickly because I wanted to point out that guy right there. Uh, that guy is Eric, and, that's, and I was lucky to start out. Eric is the CEO of our company, and whenever anything went wrong, we got on airplanes and we flew to where it was, and we saw people and we saw it going wrong. And the lesson I learned early on is you don't get empathy from data. It's empathy that we're looking at, and there's this word that gets a little overused in, in, a, lean, in, in a lean context. And, and I've worked in Japan before, and they'll often refer to Gemba as the floor where the developers work. But for products, it ain't there. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute that you are Jane Goodall. Is that working? <laughs> hey, when, uh, my talk is supposed to end at exactly what time? I'm watching my time to make sure I get through all this. Uh, Oh, good. OK. Because I haven't adjusted my time zone yet. <laughs> so I'm already really late. <laughs> uh, yeah, good. Thank you. Now, uh, uh, Jane spends a lot of time out in the field. It takes a long time. It's arduous. She, she hides in bushes. She, she watches uh, gorillas. And, and somebody might look at her and say, geez, Jane, this is horribly inefficient. We've got this uh, idea for you that will make your research process much more efficient. We'll call this chimpanzee on site. And, and we will bring the chimps directly to you. And then if you have questions about the chimp, you can just lean over and kind of observe or watch or ask. And uh, well, the, that's not the kind of thing we're doing. We, we don't get empathy that way either. They might get empathy with us, but uh, that's just not the way it works. So don't, don't do that. Do this. And well, when I look through my hard drive, I've got piles of photos of where I've gone out uh, to, to do this. Hey, this picture was taken not all that far from here, just off Fremont Street at a big company that does, uh, uh, I can't say the company name, but uh, uh, if I said they screwed up LIBOR, you might know who they are. Uh, uh, but in this particular company, we were told, gosh, you can't, you can't talk. Um, you can't talk to the portfolio managers. They're busy people. They make millions of dollars. And, and, uh, yeah, and we can arrange a meeting uh, for you sometime. And I said, great, no problem. Uh, where do they work? Well, they're on the third floor, but you can't go down there. And I said, OK, uh, no problem. Hey, uh, we're curious about getting some pictures of their work area. Can we take pictures? And no, 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 that's, that's not OK. We'd have to get permission from legal to, to do that. And I said, OK, that's, that's OK. And then I went over to the elevator, pressed the third floor, went down, and, and, uh, and this guy says, God, nobody ever comes and talks to us at all. And uh, they are they're thrilled to talk. And, uh, and we learn a lot about context. And well, these guys are traders also. And uh, they work together in teams of four. And, and because they work closely together in teams, to, to, they're not traders, excuse me, they're portfolio managers. They need frequent conversation with each other. So somebody, in their wisdom, had said, these guys need a chat feature in this software. And it's got to be high priority, because they really need to talk. And they hadn't actually gone down and see that they have arranged their decks so they can stare at each other in the face. Uh, uh, but so being there, showing up, helps a lot. And the, the only reason I want you to see this picture is well, when the, one of the mornings I showed up, their analytics had crashed. And this is, a, this is a big deal. It causes big trouble. And they're all looking at that, the quant there who's trying to fix the models and get it going. The important thing for you to pay attention to is how freaking dark it is there. Uh, because for these guys to do this work, they've got to be up and at the, they've got to be there at 5 in the morning. And I had to get up at I don't know what time, 3.30 or something, to get from Alameda over there. Uh, that was, if you want to see where things happen, it takes a little bit of effort. 
Now, actually, I want to go to this particular guy. Um, and I'm going to mention Edmunds.com a couple times here because this guy works for Edmunds. Uh, this is Atik. Uh, Atik was responsible for analytics. And Edmunds was a company that, well, years ago, we'd been asked to help them convert to a design thinking process. And one of the first things we did is say, look, you have to start talking to the people you build your software for. And then this was a frightening thing. And see, uh, so a couple of those people are developers, and one of them isn't. Can you guess which one isn't? I'm just curious. Uh, but Atik is talking to someone. And they, uh, during this day, he interviewed several people. And he's in charge of analytics. And I remember at the end of the day, uh, he was sort of just struck that Look, I can tell you exactly what people do. I've always been confident that I can tell you precisely what they do, but it's not until today that I, that I realized that I could never tell you why. You get what people did from data, but you, you're missing this one critical component. The lesson learned for me, again, is that well, data isn't empathy. And so, OK, great, let's move on from there then. If we can't do research, if we really need to get out there and get empathy, what we need is a better product owner. Because they're the ones that screw things up. If we don't get the right person in that job, it's, it's their fault. And they need to be able to tell us what to do. Now, I want to give you this simple model that comes from a, a guy I've known for a few years now, a guy named Marty Kagan. Uh, Marty started as a product manager, one of the first product managers in Netscape, and he joined eBay. I believe he was the third product manager hired at eBay, and he, when he left eBay, he was in charge of 60 product managers, so he kind of grew up in this. Uh, he will say that if you are a product person, you are responsible for identifying a product that is valuable to the people who are going to use it and buy it, and to our organization, it has to be usable by those people. They need to be able to accomplish what they need to with it, or there's no value. And finally, it needs to be feasible to build, given the time and tools that we've got. The ideal product lives there. And because this is a lot of things to worry about, usually we might have a product a person, a product manager that looks after the, the value, but we need someone who really understands users and, and works closely with them. Now, in products, in software product companies, that's usually a user experience person. In IT centric companies, that might be a business analyst. And then finally, we've got this person that's usually left out, the one that receives the requirements, the, the engineer. It's these three people that work closely together. Now, I forgot to plug in the audio. There was just a little bit of audio I had here. Because I had to hear from Marty. Hey, is the audio on? Yes. Uh, it's uh, in organizations that I follow behind Marty, life is, lot, is great for me. Because he's already said, look, if, you, if product management is going to work, you've got to have tight collaboration between this small, balanced team. You need people that work together, that understand how things are built, uh, why things are built, and, and who's going to use them. And well, I generally find that engineers are left out. And I grab this little no, snippet from Marty. Responsible for functionality, the designer, and usability, and the engineer on feasibility, the little secret in software teams is that um, truth is, usually the best innovations actually come from the lead developer. Um, and the reason for that is that the lead developer typically knows what's possible better than anyone. I consistently see really fabulous things. I just left a, a, I just left a workshop uh, with a company. Monday and Tuesday, I was in Scottsdale, Arizona. The minute we start involving developers with talking directly with users, with actually getting a chance to come up with those requirements, actually solving problems, they light up. They come up with a lot better things than, well, than anybody has before. And they, and they light everyone else up with them. I'm a hater of that product ownership term because I want everybody to own, and I want product owners to be better leaders. So uh, product owners lead a cross-functional team, and they help everyone take ownership. Then um, th th there's this last thing here that basically, if fine, if we get the right people, and they really work well together, and they understand their customer, then we'll get it right, right? Now, 
there's Marty again, and I was, last summer I had to work with him on something. I was sitting in the car next to him, and he nonchalantly said this phrase like, if you're really good at this stuff, uh, you'll be right about a third of the time. And I said, wait, say that again? And he said, uh, well, typically, uh, between 50 and 80, you know, 50 to 80 percent, I had him repeated back. Uh, and it got a little more concise than I like, but 50 to 80% of the things that we put out there fail. They don't meet their original expectations. I said, you're kidding me, uh, because I still was fooling myself about that. I thought I could, we could get this right. And he said, no, 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 if you're good at it, you fail most of the time. That's the way it is. And a lot of our ideas fail, so we pull them down. And then, uh, well, the ones that might succeed a little bit, we've got to iterate them a lot before they succeed. This is hard stuff. And I start to recall those charts that people show, especially agile trainers show, these Standish group, these chaos report things, where depending on the year you look at it, anywhere between 65 and 75% of features are rarely or never used. Uh, that sounds bad when you hear it. Uh, Ruling out some obvious things like, you know, airbags are rarely or never used in cars. Uh, 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 so they must be worthless. Uh, but <laughs> the truth is, a lot of ideas seem like good ideas at the time. It is difficult to, well, we might start with a, an opportunity, and from that opportunity, we might come up with a, a couple different solutions. Now, I don't even remember what this old quote, this is old now, and everybody knows the, the Zune's gone away, but the, uh, there are some people that really believe that Zoom thing would work. Uh, and that can get a little scary for those people. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, I do have to get the next picture. Uh, yeah, that's the one I want. Now, this is Eugene. Eugene's in, Eugene is in charge of product management at Edmunds.com. And I said, look, this is Mar I think Marty's crazy. Uh, Eugene, uh, I'm hearing from Marty, and you guys have been at this design thinking stuff a long time. You're getting a lot better at metrics. You're paying attention to how well things work. Uh, you know now how often these things work. Marty's saying that you, you, if you're good, you'll be right about 30% of the time or something like that, and Eugene, says to me, no, no, we're probably right about two in 10, two times out of 10. You can tell he's not a developer. He would have simplified that fraction to one in five. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the things that's happened with Eugene over years, you know, they hadn't been talking to customers. They hadn't been experimenting. But over years, he says, you know, we've, we've built, we've had to really build measurement muscles up. Uh, we started by using simple or testing tools like test and target, but we found to really get the precise metrics that we want, we've had to start rolling our own uh, uh, stuff to, to measure. And now we're pretty good at this, and that's why we know we suck at this. And the lesson for me is that this is hard. We're usually wrong, and we have to start planning on failing a lot more often than we used to. Now, the one other team, and I'll talk about a a couple teams, these are the teams I've had the longest term relationships with and I've seen them evolve over years. This is a company called snagajob.com. No one here, has anyone here ever visited this site before? If you were looking for a job at Burger King, this is where you go. Um, so this, that was a team at their regular standup and they, they've got this nice board and because they're focusing on things, the, the last edge of their board isn't done, the last edge of their board is ready for release, and then it sits, once it's released, it's tagged, it sits there and it gathers data. And it has to gather data, depending on how long it's been there, for, for hours or days or weeks, and they've got metrics they're trying to influence. And, well, they explicitly release, they explicitly measure, and nothing leaves that board and, until they've learned something. Now, uh, I wanted to put this guy on there. This is Thomas, and I talked with Thomas in, in preparation for this. I'm trying to gather more recent lessons. I, I find that there are, are companies that are in this, inside this journey, and things aren't going so well. They don't want to talk about it, so that's been tough. But uh, the people that are coming out the other end, 
have really learned some things. And um, this particular project where these guys have been measuring, I watched them thrash for close to a year on this thing. They were trying to replace an old version of their website with a new version of their website, and the revenue per visit, the revenue per visitor would just never come up. They couldn't replace the, the old with the new because they were going to lose money, and not just a little, a lot of money. And at the end, Thomas, who's in charge of products, said, ah, yeah, we, we scrapped that. Um, but the important thing was that after chewing on this thing for a year, we got a really great architecture out of it. And I'm learning more and more that great architecture is sort of important to doing this stuff. And well, one of the big uh, assumptions that I hear that is that really great architecture is all about scalability and performance. And what I'm starting to understand now is that's not it. In fact, that's the stuff we've been focusing on for a long time. Now, Snagajob has had this weird architectural journey. And I think, you know, how many of you in the room have been involved with your company's architecture before? How many of you got a crap legacy architecture that you're trying to get rid of right now? It's almost the exact same number of hands. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, Snagajob, had, uh, they, had, they originally started their site, and the, the architecture didn't have a name, and they needed to fix it or make it better, so they named their new architecture Eagle. And so they built Eagle, but it had a long OODA loop. Uh, it took months to build this, or not months, excuse me, years to build this thing. And it was kind of hard to use and, and bumpy, and, and it wasn't getting adopted well, and, and people got tired of it, and they said, look, we need to launch a new architecture, and we're going to call it, instead of Eagle, we're going to call it Phoenix, because it will rise from the ashes of, of Eagle. And then Phoenix trundled along for a year or so, and the, it was starting to run the same course. And then they wanted to layer a new architecture on top of that. And they decided to call the new architecture Tucson, because Tucson is so, kind of sideways from Phoenix, if you <laughs> look at it on a map. And the, the idea was that they kept trying to get a good, strong, scalable architecture. But one of the things that happened when they were trying to chew on this problem is they focused on getting things released fast, on making things measurable, on making things testable. And well, their new architecture is called Somersault, and it's sticking. Oddly, it's easy to use. It's easy to build things in. And along the way, they've built scalability underneath it. They built performance underneath it, but it is optimized around speed to get things done. Now, I was recently, Bill Scott came from Netflix. Was he big at Netflix? Or is he just a troublemaker? <laughs> he's big, yeah. And well, he's at PayPal now, so he's definitely a troublemaker there. And I saw him recently sort of complaining that, look, traditional engineers start with reuse, and they end up with something that's just way too complex. Uh, he had a nice mantra, this use before reuse mantra. Look, let's make sure that people can use it at all uh, before we focus on that reuse thing. <laughs> and when I go back and talk to Eugene just recently, he said, look, we built our CMS with A-B testing in mind. Uh, uh, we well, I think what I had already said, they used to mix in a lot of different things, but over time they've realized that we need faster, more surgical results, and the companies I see that are doing this well aren't using off-the-shelf tools, they're rolling their own. Now, one of the interesting things Eugene said is, you kind of have to go through. You kind of have to go through this uh, having nothing, adopting a big tool, realizing it doesn't work, and throwing it away and building your own. If you try and leapfrog frog those things, it doesn't work. Um, you kind of have to pay your dues with it. And that's, that's, that's an uncomfortable thing to learn. Uh, but the lesson learned here for me is that Engineer, we need to engineer first for experimentation and focus on scalability and performance later. Now, great, fine, we, we've got an architecture, then all we need to do here is to build, measure, learn. Now, I'm not going to explain Agile to this crowd. I, I probably, I don't need to explain Lean Startup to this crowd. Not much. Uh, and the build, measure, learn loop is a simple idea. It's, it's, it's the new OODA. It only has three steps, so it's better. Uh, <laughs> and it uh, basically means let's get an experiment out there. And 
well, there's a, I've seen this weird bias where we can just get quick, simple experiments. And well, a lot of the organizations I work with will build simple paper prototypes or other things like that. And, and uh, talking with Bill's cohort and talking with Cody recently, he said, look, you can only learn so much with the, the highest fidelity prototypes here. You eventually need to get real. Now, I'll see if I can explain what I mean by that here. It, I love this quote from Bill Buxton, who's a, a noisy guy in the user experience world. That, that, you know, he says, the difference between high fidelity and low fidelity is just stupid. There's only right fidelity and wrong fidelity. So a lot of what I focus people on is trying to find right fidelity for the right time. And the, the two axes that I think of is, well, I, I'll, the, the looks real and the works real axes. Now, if I create something that's a simple paper, paper prototype, well, it doesn't look all that real. It looks kind of like software. Uh, but I can move the parts around, and I can use it if it was software. And so it kind of works real. And what I used to see a lot of, and still see too much of sometimes, uh, is lots of really sexy Photoshop documents. And they really look great, uh, but they, they don't work real at all. And then one of the things I'm starting to see a lot more of is a lot of faking it. A lot of faking it with manual processes or using spreadsheets to calculate things. And um, I'll explain an Edmunds example here in a second. And they, they really work real, but they don't look at all like software. And ultimately, we want this, when we finally want to make sure that people will actually use this stuff, we need something that looks real and works real, but it isn't engineered for release. It's, it, we might A-B test that in our environment. And we ratchet this up. We can start to test value with very simple things and, and prove that people will value this. We can start to let people step through things on paper or simple actual prototypes to see if they can use it. But at some point in time, we want to start measuring outcomes. And remember, outcomes are what happens when things come out. We have to ha let people use it in the wild and see if they actually behave the way we expect them to. And well, in terms of architecture, one of the things that you, they've, at Edmonds, they now have an architecture where front end developers can uh, not deploy headless apps, they, uh, heads only. Uh, basically, only front ends with, with mock databases, and they behave like real software, but they can do this very quickly on their own. So uh, I want to describe an Edmonds e experiment. And one of the things I'm seeing more and more in organizations is that to develop, to develop a real experiment, uh, we've got to spend time and money and sort of use the whole organization. This is Edmund's site today, and they launched a feature called Price Promise. And for Price Promise, the idea was simple. I, I can go in and decide I want a car. I can look for a car, and I can find dealers that are offering guaranteed low prices. They, they, they've learned that people really hate haggling with dealers. And well, to test this particular feature, Edmunds had to get the cooperation of a few dealers in the, in the Portland area. They had to build enough software to go live on the site. They had to uh, put it in their A-B switching frameworks. Only a certain amount of people got it. And the, the whole test took many months to run. They shuttled data back and forth to dealers in spreadsheets. They manually loaded it into databases on their end. Uh, they, they had lots of phone calls with dealers. But at the end of the day, they had to see if people really did use it and really did go to dealers and really did buy cars. Because if it didn't work end to end, uh, it, it wasn't really a test. Marketing had to support it by giving it branding. Sales had to support it. Uh, this is whole organization experiment experimentation. And what's interesting is that Edmunds would have never done this a couple years ago. It was not OK. They were, they'd either spend a lot of time arguing about it and either do it all in, spend millions, or not do it at all. And that's the big change that I'm seeing. Now, I know I'm over time, and I want to make a last point here. In fact, this is the last point. Well, and I have to make it with three slides. Is it, look, it, we keep 
discovering things. We, we, we discover uh, working closer together helps and agilely kinds of things help. We discover understanding more about users and doing something that's more like a design or design think, thinking process, that helps. We discover experimentation helps and we are pretty sure that we are going to crack this thing. Um, but what we're finding or what I hear from Eugene is that, look, we've been down this road enough times that we realize that we keep falling into this trap, that, uh, that we keep thinking the process or the methods will automatically produce success, but we now know that that's usually not the case. We are on our own. And what was interesting was Thomas sees it a completely different way. He's a little newer, and uh, from his perspective, he says, look, the process is here to help us learn. It gives us some structure for learning. Now, I don't know what's true, uh, but the, the lesson I'm gonna, my last takeaways here are, gosh, I don't know, pay attention, and don't assume you're right. Now, <laughs> I'm over time. Oh, hold on, dang it. I never have time for questions, and Jez is too young to know who the who is. Who remembers the who? Uh, good. It's time for a break, right? Do I want to take questions? We should let people go. I never have time for questions. But I think you should watch Pete Townsend. <laughs> this guy is incredible. He is so wiry. All right, that's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs>